Uh, it is now my great pleasure to invite on stage James Galeja, and you'll have to let me know if I pronounce that correctly. <laughs> One of the big topics of this conference, ladies and gentlemen, is indeed how do you combine the qualifications and what we're taught with what we need on the markets. The session we're about to go into is on lifelong learning, and there is no person better qualified to introduce this to us than James, as he is the newly appointed director of CEDIFOP. Before taking up that position, he was also the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Education and Employment in Malta. And before that, uh, CEO of the Malta Qualifications Council. James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Yes, I'm still, um, I'm still fresh. I went live next week, last week, sorry, at Cedefop. In fact, my, my badge is still classified under the old taxonomy because it calls the Ministry of Education and Employment of Malta. But I'm very pleased to be here and try to answer the questions that you, um, that you raised. Um, before I do that, um, I hope you are all familiar with uh, Cedefop. Um, this is the um, European Centre for the Development of uh, Vocational Training. We are based in um, Thessaloniki. And in the context of uh, ESCO, we are very well placed in terms of who our governors are, because we, are, we have social partners, we have governments, and we have the Commission. Uh, in a very positive way, I should say, I hope in the future, breathing down our neck to make sure that you, ESCO is really live and kicking among all the European citizens. So I really look forward for the next uh, three or four years where we shall see the development of this important tool. Um, two very brief footnotes from what I've heard in the discussions this morning and to link with how uh, CEDEFOP and ESCO will, um, will really marry each other in the, in the, coming, in the coming years. Um, I think ESCO is not any other tool. Some, some of us are afraid of additional tools. Um, not when they come handy, of course. And I think we shouldn't look at all the European tools in one box, which you have to use all the time, all the days of the week and all the months of the year. So tools are handy, and I think we should rationalize on the expression of how many tools we have in, in, the, in the use when we come to labor market issues, when we come to employability and employment. The second point which I noticed this morning is that I think that when we talk about a standardized terminology, which ESCO is creating, that standardized technology, T t terminology was not there before. We almost take it for granted that it's there, it will happen, but it was not there before. So this will enrich our experience, not just us, the people in the room who are probably converted to this language, but I, I am thinking of the unemployed, I am thinking of those who need reskilling, I am thinking of those, and I come to my third point, we spoke about the connection between the world of work and the world of education, which is correct, which is fine. But what I am interested in and what my colleagues would be pro probably interested in uh, at CEDEFOP would be that these two worlds coming together are visible to our citizens. And I think ESCO will, I hope, in many member states and beyond that, make this connection between the labor markets and between skills and competences, occupations and qualifications more visible to our citizens. And my final footnote, if I am allowed to say so, is that um, the, the data contains the right impetus and the right drive for policymakers to uh, connect employability and employment. Sometimes we use employability, sometimes we use employment, and rarely do we use the two together. This is a taxonomy where the two come together and we are making them visible, as I said, to citizens. But there is a huge but which I think is important to underline and that is that people need to acquire skills as early as possible. I'm not sure whether there are people from the school sectors in this room today. I know there are employers, I know there are people representing employees, but I think the school sector 
is an extremely important factor which will determine the success or the failure of this important tool. So to come now straight to our relationship to, um, to CEDEFOP. I think these are the four um, key areas where CEDEFOP is involved and where we have been working with the Commission since 2009, thanks to my colleagues who have been working side by side with the Commission to develop this important tool. And the four areas that I would want to briefly talk about are the, the, the areas that you see on your screen, <coughs> Europass, the validation of learning outcomes, the shift um, to learning outcomes in education and training, and forecasting of skills and skills provisions. Well, to, to go straight to the first point, I think ESCO, if it is linked to the Europass CV, it's a huge added value. In, in our opinion, of course, um, the Europass CV can be greatly improved if there's a link to the standardized classification of terms provided by ESCO. This will help individuals in the formulation of their Europass CV to be more specific, to be more attractive to their prospective employers, to be more precise about skills and competences which might be hidden somewhere in their CV but which ESCO will manage to draw up because it's visible, because it can be seen, because it's live, because it is a language which young people can understand. We all know that youth unemployment is an issue and I think this is the perfect tool to attract youth to look into their own skills and competences which I hope they would have acquired in compulsory education and reinforced and re and enforced in further education and look for the detail because, as we know, the devil is in the detail and that detail will, I hope, come out from ESCO. So I think it will greatly help citizens. It will greatly help our work. Uh, the Europass CV is one of the core elements of CEDEFOP and I think the more we work closely with the Commission on the development of ESCO, we would be strengthening the Europass CV. The second area where um, CEDEFOP is highly involved is the valuing learning outside the classrooms. So how ESCO can help us describe non-standardized learning experiences in a standardized way. We learn from informal learning, we learn through non-formal learning, but the difficulty with young people, and I've seen it in my own country, is how to formulate all of these experiences and make them rational enough for employers to understand. I think ESCO will help young people to achieve that objective. The terminological basis of these developments is of critical importance and will decide whether they will be reliable and trusted. The terminology of ESCO on occupational tasks, for example, as well as on skills and competences can support these processes in important ways. So from a set of points of view, from a research point of view, from a policy maker's point of view, we find that ESCO will eventually help young people and adult learners as well to formulate what they really know and be able to do in a structured way which is understood across, across cultures. The third area. We've spoken about um, ESCO and the shift to learning outcomes. Now, increasing the relevance of education and training is important. So how ESCO can support the writing of learning outcomes, understandable and relevant to both learners and employers. Many of you in the room have had experiences with learning outcomes. We know that there is no prototype in the way learning outcomes have been written, are being written, and probably will be written. There are some learning outcomes which are too generic. There are some learning outcomes which are too detailed and therefore they restrict creativity in the classroom. I think, and at least from a set of ops point of view, ESCO will help us in our understanding and in our sharing of knowledge with policymakers and training providers 
how learning outcomes can be refined and fine-tuned through the ESCO structured terminology. And therefore, hence, creating, I know it's a word which we normally use for qualifications, but it's important, the harmonization of how we read learning outcomes and how we design eventually qualifications that can be understood between different cultures and qualifications which are transparent enough for mobility and for progression and transferability. The last area that um, set of Hop works in and which is directly related to, um, to ESCO is the area of forecasting of skills needs and skills provision. Here the forecasting of skills needs is a very important task which we carry at set of Hop. Alongside the long-term projections looking forward to 2025, a new project is now being prepared addressing the short-term changes and challenges in the skills needs of the labor markets. Now, we think that the transversal terminology, is, which is already being used by set of Hobbes researchers, and the ESCO's structured terminology will help our forecasting be more structured and be more linear with the labor market needs as well as the training provision and the qualifications within, within the institutions themselves. I think in, in terms of the, of the forecasting issue, skills and competence based forecasting not only depends of, obviously on ESCO and the description of occupations and jobs through skills and competences, but it also depends on a qualification, how it should be understood how it should be leverated to the EQF, and therefore, in this respect, when we come to forecast skills, we are keeping two huge realities in front of our eyes, thanks to ESCO, which are occupations on one side, which requires skills and competences, which is the second pillar, but also qualifications. To conclude, because I suppose my time is running out, um, ESCO is, and we still believe very strongly, it is a very important uh, instrument. It is a supporting tool. It is not any other tool, but it is another tool in our toolbox, which will come handy, especially to young people who are looking for jobs and for employers who are designing um, job descriptions, for the training providers who is planning and who is writing qualifications. ESCO will be, I think, uh, the future of the relationship that should exist between education or the world of education and the world of work. It, is, it adds practical value in the terminology that we need to be applied in concrete areas. And I know that the panelists, after my speech, will be de delving into this huge challenge of how to transform a tool such as ESCO, which is online, which can be accessed by everyone, into a practical way of transforming unemployability into employability or unemployment into employment, or how to sustain your position within your, your, your industry, within your place of work. It is important, therefore, to conclude to synergize between ESCO and other EU initiatives particularly, of course, the European Qualifications Framework. The dialogue between the labor markets and education training cannot be solved by ESCO alone. A minimum condition is that the relationship to the EQF is further developed and that these two initiatives are closely connected. And finally, the terminology and the classifications provided by ESCO should not be seen as a norm defining the exact relationship between occupations, skills, and qualifications. ESCO can help us describe this relationship, but it, not, it must not be treated as a standard. So while the terminology will be helpful in defining qualifications and for writing individual CVs, as I have indicated before, it is not up to ESCO to decide how these will look at the end of the day. So I hope that um, ESCO itself will be a success story. I have high hopes that within SEDOFOP, uh, within SEDOFOP as an organization, we will fully support this initiative because it is a lifeline to us. 
if you had to extract from SEDOFOP occupation, qualifications, skills and qualifications and, and competences, then we might as well close up our shop and go home. So thank you very much. Now, please just stay at the podium for a minute. Um, you talked a lot about the world of education and the world of work, and you asked a question. You said, I wonder how many people in the audience are actually from a school? So let's just see. Is anybody here? Right, could you tell, wh where are you from? Here we go. You're from Malta. <laughs> You know this man, you've seen him before. Large population, so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ronald Cormie. I'm presently the registrar of the Malta College of Arts, Science and Technology. The world of education, you've heard how Sedefop is approaching that link with ESCO. What about you, where you work? How do you see the connection happening? Well, um, I think I would be speaking in the name of my colleagues also. We, we see this as very relevant because we are currently revising all our existing qualifications and um, converting them all to learning outcomes-based qualifications. And this would be very relevant to, to what we are doing right now. We have several projects which are running. And uh, this could also come in line um, uh, with, for example, um, how we design our qualifications, whether we, sh we would look at, um, uh, in Malta currently we do not have a lot of established standards. Um, Dr. Kalea mentioned that this should not be treated as a norm, not as a standard. However, you have to look at something to make a qualification relevant. And I think ESCO can provide at least a guideline on, on how a qualification, especially vocational qualifications, can be made more relevant to the uh, to the world of work. Um, I had a question originally, which I did not ask earlier, but maybe um, Dr. Kalea can also. Um, uh, how um, it, this relates in a way with, with what Dr. Kalea was saying uh, for the fact that some countries do have very well established standards and uh, how there would be alignment between what ESCO will be providing as guidelines and knowledge, skills, and competencies, and how these fit in then um, uh, towards the locally established standards. And another question, if I may, would be on how ESCO would treat um, these transnational qualifications, which were mentioned in the very beginning of this conference, um, whereby, for example, Microsoft qualifications or, or EASA qualifications for aviation um, or IMO qualifications for maritime. Um, how would these actually eventually, because I've seen that engineering does not feature in any way so far, probably because it's a minefield, so nobody wants to explore it as yet. But eventually it would have to also feature in, I guess. Very good. Before you answer those, we're just going to go to the lady over there, who is also saying she comes from the world of education. Here we go. Could you just introduce yourself? I'm Alexandrina Sybu from Romania. I'm working in university and also in uh, private sector. So I uh, uh, succeed to uh, work uh, in both sides without any problems. And uh, I, consider, I consider that uh, ISCO is an opportunity to put uh, all together in a connection. Uh, regulated profession through IMI, um, uh, all profession at a national level in relationship with national qualification as well, EQF. And uh, my question could be related to the development of the system. Uh, it is mentioned that ISCO will be a reference uh, and in the same time will be core part of this system which will be connected. But as uh, uh, 
uh, of the late dimension before, uh, different part of the system will be developed in different uh, uh, rate, with different rate. And uh, for that reason, uh, how we can succeed to put all the system together without any uh, lo uh, lost part uh, in this process of evolution, and uh, which uh, will be, in this sense, the role of ESCO uh, forward. Thank you very much. James, would you like to go at those? Very difficult questions, and probably the ESCO board would be in a better position to answer what will happen with the uh, ESCO tool. Um, I, I can see developments here, to, to reply to Ronald's uh, question here. Um, I think the, the more ESCO is developed, uh, we, we, we have to see this in time. We cannot, we cannot predict. We are not prophets here. But the more we support ESCO, the more information uh, is provided within ESCO itself, the more it develops, and the more it will change its dynamics nothing is cast in stone and the labor market itself and the training providers and the training institutions and the globalization of education and all the training that is taking place everywhere now in the world will probably change the profile of ESCO from what we know today. ESCO today is ESCO zero or zero ESCO. There will be an ESCO one, ESCO two, ESCO three. And I think all of the issues that you have raised in terms of international qualifications, um, cross-cultural qualifications and qualifications which do not normally fall for some reason or other under the EQF will probably find a place in ESCO because employers would want them there, but because learners would want them there, because job seekers would want them there, because the European Union would want them there, because they are part of an enriching labour market. So I think it will develop, it will change in time. Very good. So keep your hats on. ESCO version 1 just around the corner. James, can I ask you to sure. take one of these seats, maybe at the far end, and then it's my great pleasure to invite a lot more people up on stage. I hope we can get everybody on stage. This is going to be the challenge. Um, Wilfried Baumgart uh, is a member of the ESCO board, another member of the ESCO board, works in the Ministry of Education and Training for the Flemish community of Belgium, and is on the EU Advisory Committee for VET and EQF and lots of other things. Uh, Jos Nolsen is a pedagogical counsellor and technical at a technical secondary school. So again, somebody from a school background, that's very good. Previous to that, he was at the Ministry of Education and Vocational Training in Luxembourg with a focus on the EQF and ECVET and is also on the EQF advisory board. So any questions about how this matches with EQF, etc., Jos is probably the good person to ask on that. Jennifer McKenzie, where are you Jennifer? There we go, uh, works in the Irish Department of Education and Skills as a director of the National Centre for Guidance in Education. Uh, she represents Ireland to the European Union on the European Lifelong Guidance Policy Networks which has the most unpronounceable acronym I've ever come across, E-L-G-P-N, I wouldn't know how to pronounce that, um, and chairs the Quality Assurance and Evidence-Based Cluster Group there. And on top of that, she has previously worked as an Adult Educational Guidance Coordinator. So a lot of experience here. Then Professor Luisa Cotino, and you'll have to tell me if I got that right. <laughs> is a professor of mechanical, mechanical engineering at the Technical University of Lisbon, is the executive director of the European Federation for Welding, Joining and Cutting, and, again, bridging these two worlds, is an entrepreneur and has founded three successful companies in laser cutting, industrial automation and advanced training system. So you bridge those two worlds very nicely. And then finally, Anna, but not least, Annabelle de Kranen. Did I get that right? No, Kranen. Annabelle de Kranen uh, works for the Public Employment Service of Flanders, the VDAB, is program manager of four projects, uh, including safe e-portfolio for citizens, 
job matching and self-service tools for employers and personal development and underpinning all of that has been a guidance counsellor and trainer for disadvantaged groups. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our panel for this afternoon, really exploring the world of education, how it makes the link to the world of work and how ESCO can facilitate all of that. Now, I think the Twitter wall has gone a little bit quiet recently. Um, that quote has been up there for a while now. So get tweeting or use that other form of communication, the hand, and I will come bounding into the audience as fast as I can with the microphone, hopefully not falling flat on my face in the process. But this is a very important moment now to really focus while we can on this world of education and this piece of the puzzle, how it fits. So I have a general question for our panel. James said that ESCO is a tool and he believes it's a useful tool, which is a good start. But even a useful tool is not worth anything if it is not applied and used. You all come with a different perspective, representing a different community. How are you going to apply ESCO? And do you think it's a useful tool? Perhaps we could start with ladies first from this end. Please just take the microphone. I think I have, have oh, you've, you're, oh, oh sophistication. I'm here. still with a hand. Ah, on perfect. Mic. Technology, right? <laughs> Please. Yeah. So thank you very much. So I think it's a good question, James. And uh, you know, I represent the international qualifications because I represent the European Welding Federation, where we have a system for a harmonized system for training, qualification, and certification of personnel. And you know, this is a system that has been in place for 20 years. But I tell you a story. When we started to trying to harmonize the welding qualifications in Europe, it took five years to develop the first two major documents, the guideline for training and the rules for the quality assurance system. I have been listening to what has gone here during you know, this morning and how ESCO will help, and I cannot you know, think on how easier our life would have been if this would be in place when we first started. And even so, now that is, you know, these qualifications are applied in the market, 40, 45 countries, I think, now apply these qualifications, but we still need to do some work on the definition of the learning outcomes. And I think that, that even for well-established international qualifications, ESCO will be of help for this next phase. Yeah. And for more recent ones, I'm sure. So the, 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 it will be of help. So only the possibility of having you know, the translation of the major terminologies used in a different language will actually facilitate a lot the understanding of the content of these qualifications in different countries. Great. Thank you very much. So the terminology and being able to have that in different languages is very important for you, from your perspective. Yeah. Please. Because there's just, you know, when I told you that it took five years and then, uh, okay, the system was implemented, it started in 12 countries. When the auditors that were trained to uh, do the assessments of the different organizations using this system, with that, those rules that took five years to develop, they found out that different countries have an interpretation of the rules that was different. Sure. Yeah. So I think ESCO will help enormously in that. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Annabel, from your perspective. I have to use the micro. Um, from my perspective, well, um, this morning uh, one of the panel uh, people said uh, as last word, just there. And I like that very much because um, we in uh, the VDIB, we had the opportunity just to have a board that said, just there. Don't wait for ESCO there. So we uh, put in a, a, a competence framework in our systems last year. It took us a year of working around, at it, but it's already there from January. And I am um, very pleased that we see employers using it. Vacancy already, 70% of our vacancies are filled in with competences. So it works. 
uh, job seekers uses it and in the matching it goes very fine great so there is a lot of uh, things that have to be uh, that go better and so on but it's a very useful uh, thing so now the uh, the great challenge for us will be how uh, we will link this framework that we use to ESCO to have the European level, but that will not be no problem, I think. <laughs> very good, thank you. So that's an amazing figure, 70% are already using yes. competences. Yes. That's very good, thank you. Great, please, from your perspective, does that mic work? It does. It does. Okay. Um, I suppose speaking from the perspective of guidance, there was a mention of guidance, I think, by most speakers this morning. Um, and I, I think the one thing that's most important is that guidance facilitates the person to make the decisions for themselves as to what education they want to get involved in, where they want to move within education, or what job they actually want to get into and start looking for and, and entering into the job search, and then the jobs, you know, skills matching. And I think the more information that is up-to-date, relevant and, and backed up at European level as well as national level, the better for the guidance practitioners because um, it's vital to help the person to actually make the right decision for them. So the clearer the information, the better for the individual and the better for the guidance service in supporting that individual. But also very important is where someone in the ed is looking to either continue with education or come back into education. So, for example, someone who is unemployed and has a lower level of skills who is looking at or qualifications, is looking at where they can re-enter the education system to be able to look at the competencies they have because they've worked in a shop for 20 years with no training or certification. But to actually look at that and, and enter into the, you know, the validation of non-formal or, uh, non or informal learning so that they can come back into the education and training system and move on to qualifications if they wish or use the skills and competencies they've developed to enter in to a different job search or a different uh, course option. Um, so I think from a guidance perspective, I mean, I could... I could spend all afternoon telling you how useful it would be for guidance. But I think to use it as a tool, it, would, it, you know, it, it could be a central tool for guidance. Very, very helpful. It speaks to me personally as well, because I have to tell you that there is no training course on facilitating in this way. It's all non-formal and informal learning. And I might need some guidance on how to get future jobs in the future. So that's very good. Thank you. Jos, from your perspective, what does how can you use ESCO? Why will this tool be useful? Um, okay. Uh, ESCO is really a tool. Uh, if you, you can use it only if you have some, let's say, other things in, in place. And one of the important things related to qualifications is that the qualifications are designed together with labor market. And I think there ESCO can get his value because you have a common language. You have the language of knowledge, skills, and competence, or learning outcomes, if you want. And if only you are in this level, you have the, social, uh, the, the labor market, the world of working, together with the world of school or training, you are developing in common the qualifications then you have the possibility really to use ESCO as one of the tools to describe them because then on, finally you have on both sides you have a language each of them will understand. The, the people in school, the teachers know what they are learn, uh, transmitting. You have the learner who can show what he has learned and is able to do what was said previously. And thirdly, you have the labor market who understands what is really in the qualification. A thing we, nowadays, we are going towards this situation, but I think we have a lot of work to do in the future. Very good, thank you. So again, this theme of communicating between the worlds and the role of ESCO, if you like, being a dictionary to explain one to the other. Wilfred, from your perspective. Uh, my perspective is... Uh the perspective from the, let's say, advisory group on EQF. It's uh, from the perspective of all countries working on qualification standards. 
describing qualifications and learning outcomes, skills, competences, knowledge. And um, what we are doing there is to create a new generation of qualification standards. Um, <clears throat> I will directly give an example. And uh, we, are, we have just started, so some countries are forerunners and a lot of countries are still in the development phase, but we are going now to qualification standards, focusing on achievement, output. And another in interesting issue is that we are um, exchanging information on the quality assurance of education and training. And that's an, an important issue to bring in in the discussion, but let's say we, we cover it from the qualification side. <clears throat> from the uh, access to the European labour market, I should uh, add the uh, European Directive 2005-36. This is a directive that is regulating the access to regulated professions. It's just amended, so there are new opportunities now within this directive. For example, we can now uh, come to common training frameworks, so we can develop, let's say, harmonized training uh, programs. And that's a new opportunity that is uh, brought by this direct directive and that we pick up in the qualification pillar. So what is now the benefit of ESCO? That is that we bring together the experience, the intelligence that we have now from the qualification work, the qualification side, in, in, a, in, a, in a joint project with uh, employers and uh, public employment service, so that we can connect both sides. I just give you one example now of uh, an old-fashioned qualification, because it was mentioned this morning in the framework of PIAC. So indeed, on the base of PIAC results, we see that in some countries, I will not mention them, it doesn't matter if you, you leave school after lower secondary, or that you stay two, year, two years later, longer, because the achievement level is the same. And uh, you could say, okay, uh, somebody with a qualification coming from that country, we, we, have, uh, we are a little bit, uh, let's say, um, put on the, wrong side, on the wrong track, because we think it's a higher level, but looking at the achievement, they are still on the, on the level of lower secondary. This is only the, the case when we talk about diplomas uh, connected to input processes, schooling, duration, etc. But in the new approach to qualifications, we are looking to learning outcomes, to achievement. And then it will be very clear that in some countries, the leaving certificate of high secondary education will be of the same level of the lower secondary education in another country. That's the effect of the use of transparency tools, and that's what we need if we are really going to a skills competence approach and to get rid of the old-fashioned approach of, uh, let's say, believing in papers, titles, without knowing what is behind, what quality assurance, what learning outcomes are behind. So it's, it's a paradigm shift, and we do it now together with employment and, uh, and employment service. Thank you very much. This is actually a rather dangerous uh, trend for me because I have lots of titles but actually very little competence. So um, your system is going to find me out. But I just want to turn to the audience. I mean, what do we think about this paradigm shift? And I particularly would like to ask people who are involved in the education sector in designing these qualifications. We're hearing a lot about the need for these qualifications to be more orientated towards the market and that ESCO can play a big role in that and you're hearing that also from people who are very active in that world of education being very enthusiastic about this move and this development is that enthusiasm shared amongst you or has anyone got a concern on that please sir here we go could you just pass the microphone back um, I can confirm that this is a very valid point because 
um, particularly in our case, the Malta College of Art, Science and Technology owes its success in Malta because it has always um, tried to address the needs of industry in designing its qualifications. So this is a crucial point which needs to be addressed by the persons in education to making the qualifications more relevant. The problems we have encountered in our case is that when you try to engage in this dialogue with industry, you really need a solid framework. And in Malta particularly, the 90% uh, uh, of, of the companies in Malta are uh, micro-enterprises. We don't even speak about small to medium-sized enterprises. They are micro-enterprises with 10 people or less. Um, so it is very difficult to engage such companies into dialogue to actually design the qualifications to their particular needs. So that is the challenge I would see in the local context of Malta. However, in, in other countries where there is more structured dialogue with, with industry through the Chamber of Commerce or, or similar entities, then this would become more possible. But having ESCO, um, which can also give us a glimpse of what the larger countries, we have to bear in mind that Malta is just 415,000 people in all, 240 square kilometers. So um, in having ESCO showing us what the dialogue, for perhaps uh, in other countries, how that is developing can also help us um, uh, with, with insights of what the, the skills requirements for that particular industry would be, even without meeting our local industry so often. Thank you very much. So a very important role there for ESCO. Um, I have another question for you. It's just come on the tweet wall. And um, I don't, this might be rather specific, but it's how ECVET can be incorporated into ESCO in order to match occupations with education and lifelong learning. Could the person who wrote that tweet, where, where are you in the room? Here we go. Do you want to add anything to that question? And is there a particular panelist you would like this to be directed to? If you would, not mind standing up. Just move your computer. Yes, the chairs are a bit awkward. Well done. <laughs> All right. Um, Jana Orfanedu from Cyprus, uh, representing private education sector, and as well EFET, the European Forum for Vocational Education and Training. And um, we have been uh, utilizing trying to promote ECVET in order to approach formal and informal education and uh, checking ESCO since this morning, yes, I find it very relevant in uh, the vocational credit system. So, uh, checking skills and competencies model and apply all this uh, data available now, I think that the best way in order to promote ESCO is to approach it through the ECVET system, especially in the educational uh, sector, which they will support lifelong learning and bring inside industry in order to understand the whole structure of uh, ESCO and how it can be implemented. So actually, my question, it was an answer to the panel discussion, how can we release the potential of ESCO uh, for education? Thank you. Would anyone on the panel like to add or comment on that? Please, Wilfred. So the, the last three, four years, we had a lot of EGVET projects, European projects, and uh, even before the EGVET recommendation. So the Commission was very proactive to, to fund projects even before the recommendation. So that's good. We had a, a testing period of four years. Uh, the disadvantage is that we, we are looking now at the results of these projects, and they are going all directions. So the, the first step, that's my personal opinion, is now that in the perspective of the evaluation of this EGVET recommendation, we should uh, have more steering, more guidance, and uh, one of the directions we, we should guide the EGVET projects and developments is in the direction of, let's say, um, connecting the education standards learning standards with the labor market needs and then the ESCO tool can be useful for that. There are other tools but that's one of the tools. 
So there are some EGVET minor EGVET projects just focusing on programs. Uh, there are others just focusing on <coughs> occupational tasks. And then you have projects mixing the two, looking for a bridge. And I think these are the good models to promote within the EGVET and to connect with ESCO. <coughs> Oops. There we go. Thank you. I mean, staying on the same theme, actually, Louisa, I'd like to turn to you quickly. Um, international and sectorial qualifications, in a particular your sector looking at welding qualifications, um, these need to be part of ESCO. A gentleman earlier said, you know, where are the engineering aspects? I mean, no, you are not quite into engineering, but we're getting there. Um, how do we do this? within ESCO, they have mentioned as a requirement and vacancies. What's, what's your idea? How do we bring in these qualifications? So maybe, you know, maybe I'll start with the second part of your question. So how they match the advertisement of, for vacancies with ESCO, yeah? So uh, again, so I'll, an example about what happens in welding, which is pretty much engineering. <laughs> <laughs> welding is actually an interesting example because it's cross-sectorial, so you use welding for everything from, you know, light metal working like the chairs to airplanes, yeah, to, you know, mobile phones and all, yeah, it's used everywhere. Anyway, you understand pretty well that, uh, you know, if a job vacancy for a welder for an airplane is um, advertised in the same way as a job, uh, as, as a vacancy for an, uh, a welder for, for chairs, it's, you probably won't want to go in that plane, yeah. <laughs> so there are, you know, different levels of welders, yeah. So when we advertise for a job, you know, for, for, a, for a vacancy, we usually say, the, I think if I got it straight, if I don't, you just throw things at me, but the occupation will be welder, yeah then the skills competences will say gas welding for tubes in stainless steel, for instance, yeah? And then it will say the qualification is the European qualification or according to a standard. EN 287 is pretty much used for welders. Yeah, and then, and then the job seekers, the reason why it is done it in this way, with, I think, you know, we need to have that, it's because welding is actually an international profession. It's cross-borders, so welders move around not only around Europe, they move internationally. And they need to understand which are, which are the skills and competences they are, that are required for this job. Yeah, so in this case, and, and so it has to be simply phrased so that you know, it's easy to be translated in different languages, yeah? So, and in this case, it's pretty much technical. So I'm not sure if you know, the terminology in ESCO will go as far as such technical levels. But I give you another example. For, you know, the, the, the professions in welding that are more related with coordination, welding coordination, which are engineers, specialists, technologists, and so on. So when, an ad, uh, when there is an advertisement for a vacancy for welding coordination, it usually says occupation, it's welding coordinator. And then it only refers, uh, refers to the qualification. And it says European welding engineer, which is the one that is more widely known. And this is not, not good, yeah, because Euro the European welding engineers are very high level people. And for many jobs, like for instance now for the implementation of EN 1090, which is a new standard on construction that just is being applied in Europe since recently, we don't need a person with an university degree, an MSc, and a post graduation on top. And so, actually, if we could use ESCO terminology to phrase the skills of these people and relate, you know, the three levels of welding coordination that exists in, in, in the European harmonized qualifications to the, the skills and competences that would actually help pretty much in matching you know, job, job seekers with job offers. Yeah. So I think in that sense ESCO is going to be helpful. Right. Well, then we're beginning to move into the territory of standardization and ESCO maybe as a normative tool. Uh, Wilfred, uh, auf Deutsch? No, sorry. Was it a comment? <laughs> no? Oh, sorry. Um, Wilfred, uh, on that aspect, uh, should or could ESCO lead to a harmonization of education and training systems, which would then help 
for example, in the welding. I mean, is that something that's desirable? So the harmonization of national systems is not an objective of ESCO. Um, it, I refer to what Mike was saying. I think it's already uh, a very ambitious goal to harmonize terminology. If we succeed in that, then we, we have done a step forward. Um, the most of the work has to be done still on national level. We have heard it from Gert and from other persons. So the work on qualification standards, occupation profiles, because of the dynamics of labor markets and educational training systems, should be uh, situated on national level, in national databases. And then we can use ESCO as a, a meta tool. We have said it's an interoperability tool to connect these national systems that already exist or are, are in development. There is uh, a third category of countries, countries that has, have still to start national systems. And then they can use the ESCO tool, the ESCO data models, as an inspiration source, inspiration model to start. So that's another use of ESCO. But ESCO is not meant to, to harmonize uh, national systems, and certainly not education and training systems or VET systems. Uh, if we see some convergence or harmonization of, let's say, VET systems, okay, professional-oriented programs, that will be the result of uh, a European directive or uh, the European Qualification Framework, and not uh, of ESCO. No. Well, Just to give you an example, yeah. so I mentioned the, the new possibility within the amended directive to come to uh, common training frameworks. One of the sectors or groups, professional group, that is going to try out is, I heard, the engineering group. Okay. Because they see the possibility to harmonize not only the occupational standards but also the, the learning program standards. So we will see if they will use it. And uh, this is a perfect example how an old tool, an old legislation, the directive dates from 2005, is now taking up new uh, evolutions coming from AQF. And I hope that they will soon also take up new uh, evolution within this ESCO tool. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Jos, you wanted to say something on this. Yeah, just a very short, uh, short um, addendum to what Wilfried said. We have a long history in Europe on harmonization and uh, like these things from 56 in, uh, uh, on, and I think one of the results of this process was precisely the transparency on qualifications. <laughs> And transference in qualifications was or is the common language on it. And then we are now back to ESCO. You see, I think ESCO is not meant, is not a tool to harmonize, but to make things transparent and clear to each of the users. Very good. So it's a tool to make things transparent and clear. Wilfred, you also said that um, some countries that don't have a strong national system yet can maybe use ESCO. I'm just wondering, um, if we look here to the audience, would any of you identify with that position? Would you say, well, you know, my country, we don't have a strong national system yet. The proposition from the panel is, well, you can use ESCO to help with that. What do you think? Is that going to be useful? First of all, is anyone within a national system that needs some more development or is it quite an early stage on this? So maybe the question is made. No, all your national systems are right up to date and... Really? Could you name two or three countries that you might think? <laughs> no? Was that a bit too controversial? Would anyone like to volunteer for this? Please. Regarding my national system, regarding your question, because I consider that it's not very good um, <clears throat> take into account. Why? Because uh, one of the 
or maybe two of experts from here, from the panel, mention that uh, ISCO is designed for harmonize uh, the terminology. So, like Professor, I can say something like that. He, uh, we try to put together in the same pool, especially European pool, uh, two uh, parts, two sides of the same um, market labor. On one uh, side is employer and uh, the other employees, yes? On uh, employer, we discuss about occupation. They are more related to occupation, and for occupation, we have a kind of other tools, and uh, employees and their skills and their competences and their uh, qualification, which are recognized or not, uh, are related to education, long life, learning, and so on and so on. And for this, we use another kind of tools. Uh, from my point of view, ISCO is to put all together to uh, join all these tools in one way so I don't have only a hammer. I have a machine which is hammer and something else and something else. I'm not a mechanical engineer, but I am an engineer. Uh, so uh, we tried here to put all together. So from that point of view, we cannot say that ISCO could be useful, uh, useful to improve the other tools at national level. That is another issue. Is Another concern, uh, we can maybe uh, uh, serve like a useful link or something like basic information, but not like a reference in this topic. So that is my opinion, which I formed before I came here, and I hope I don't change it <laughs> after the meeting. Thank you very much for that clarification. Uh, gentleman at the front. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Francis Petel. I come from France, so I didn't raise my hand because uh, I consider we have a system that is not completed, but it's uh, uh, not at the first stage. Um, it was very interesting. All that has been said has been very interesting this afternoon, but uh, I think we shouldn't confuse things. ESCO is not replacing everything. It will succeed if it's based on existing systems. We, we, we need qualification framework to build ESCO, it's one pillar. We'll need occupational frameworks uh, to build ESCO. If we do not have comprehensive occupational frameworks and qualification framework, it's impossible to, to, to build really ESCO uh, comparing uh, through competencies, comparing occupations and qualifications. So uh, we, we can't say that, uh, I think it's an important message, uh, we, we can't build a qualification framework through ESCO. We build a qualification framework in vocational education and training, we're discussing with the companies, with the social partners, I'm a social partner myself, uh, in a country just to see exactly what are the needs in terms of occupation, activities, working situations and related competencies. We work uh, on the basis of qualifications to have qualifications built with the education specialist uh, identified through learning outcomes. Uh, and then we, we can use ESCO and I hope we do. I'm chairing the cross-sector reference group. I invite you to come to the workshop tomorrow. Uh, and we will succeed if you develop ESCO on the basis of these two existing tools. Thank you. Very good. Just before we go back to the panel, I would like to draw your attention to the Twitter wall where you can see there's another debate going on with someone saying, does ESCO EU the term welding as a term translate exactly into 22 languages? You get an immediate reply. No, it's 29 different types of welding appear in ESCO. Whoops, it's just gone off the screen. But never, oh, and there's even more. All right, so there's a big debate going on on the Twitter wall as well, so please continue to use that and feed it back in. But just back here to what we, what we heard. James. Um, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I just want to make a, a reference to the last point about the tools is, uh, issue. I think we, um, we are richer rather than poorer with the European tools that have been developed since 1999. 
That is, that is something which we all acknowledge. Of course, when I have a tool and you have a tool, we are using it differently for different objectives, but it's the same tool. And that's the way we, we are seeing ESCO now. It is a tool in our hands which we can use in different ways. And therefore, the earlier we use it, the better. The more visible we make it, the better. And um, I think it will be a rich, an enriching experience, not just for the policymakers and for the people in this room here, but also for young people. I connect with the careers guidance. The, the earlier we talk about ESCO in schools, and when I talk about schools, I mean compulsory schooling, the more visible we are making to our students, the reality which is made up of occupations, skills and competences which they have to acquire, and qualifications which will provide them with access to the labor market. And I think this tool, ESCO's tool, is the perfect combination of all of these realities put together and which I think would be attractive enough and realistic enough and pragmatic enough to transform education into a more relevant reality for the future. Well, thank you for making the link to guidance, because I'm just coming to guidance in a minute. But, Wilfred, you wanted to have a final word on this. Just to react on, uh, on, on the intervention coming from Cyprus. Uh, one of the examples that you already now can use or benefit from ESCO version zero to, to plug in in your national systems is this, uh, it's a draft list, but it's already there and it will be available, I think, I look to Martin, at the end of the year in 22 languages, is the list of these transversal skills and competences. So we have been talking about uh, soft skills uh, during uh, five years uh, all over Europe, but we had never one draft list of what we mean by that. And now we, we have at least a starting list that is publicly available and soon in, in 22, 25 languages. It's a starting point, but it's, it's already a benefit for all the countries who are talking now about transversal skills, soft skills, etc. Very good. Thank you. I'd just like to move very quickly now to guidance. Um, Jennifer and Annabel, you're both involved in helping guide people both on their educational choices, but then also on their career choices. I mean, what is ESCO going to do in this regard? How can it help? When you uh, speak about guidance on a labor market way, it's uh, very often um, um, thinking about what is my best next step, and that is very often a switch an, a, to switch very quickly. You don't have time, you're in a transition, your employer has said it's enough or whatsoever. So you have to be uh, suddenly, very quickly, getting in the typical process of a guidance of reflect, plan and do. So um, we try to, um, to, to help people to organize this process um, by uh, when someone, a job seeker, when someone uh, tries to describe his job aspirations, so his occupations, um, we already um, give him a list, uh, the system gives him a list of tasks, like Gert Gert said, uh, give him a, a, a list of tasks that you do in this occupation. And we also, we ask at that person, um, how many years of experience do you have? And the level of experience, we already said, this task, this task, this task, this is very fine for you, you can do it. The job seeker himself can change these quotes that we give. So we ask him to reflect about it. Um, but uh, we've got a problem with that system with the young people because they don't have a lot of experience. And then the system say, oh, this does this does, but you don't have any experience, so it's mm, mm, mm. So that is something that we really, really, really are waiting for schools for education to make these learning outcomes fit to this task list we have. And we have to talk about to make the, the right fit, but then people really can uh, 
put in their job aspirations, also the young people with their tasks. Another example is when uh, people want a job um, that uh, they have a job aspiration. Um, we have this system, it's very, a very nice system. Vacancies are, uh, they put in, the employers put in the vacancies which tasks are really need to be done. Job seekers also have their profile with these activities and then our counselors and the employers and the job seekers themselves, everyone can pull out a survey of which competences uh, do not fit. So we, already, we, we immediately, well, quite immediately can have the gap anal anal analysis. So what we do then with our counselors is um, with a, a, a very simple cut and paste technique, we make a personal uh, uh, training plan for that person. And we go to the employer and we say, can't the person uh, learn these this two or three tasks at your floor? And a lot of employers say, okay, because of there are, uh, it's difficult to find someone for this occupation. Okay, we have also in, in, in Flanders, we have this system with a fee, so the employers are helped. Uh, but it's, it's working very well. Otherwise, we also can, um, if the, it, that doesn't work, we have systems like flexi training where we train the people while they're working or we try to uh, organize that. But then again, if we could have this gap analysis match it in, match it into the qualification system, we also could say to the person, go again to school, get an education, and that would be a very, very fine, very even more. <laughs> even nice. better. Yes. Very good. Thank you. And Jennifer, from your perspective. I think it links, um, I suppose, if you think of lifelong guidance within, within lifelong learning, it includes um, supporting somebody to decide what education route they want to take because ultimately they want to get a job. And then the support from job services and public employment services is to actually get the job but then when and, and support in the job but looking at guidance in the education sector um, it's it's vital to to see it within the lifelong learning arena and i think to to take james point about guidance in schools as well the the point of guidance is to help somebody to look at their interests their skills their abilities and even if they can do something now what would they like to do in the future um, I don't think I'd make much of a welder, to be honest, um, but I you know, might like to do something like your job eventually when I give up this guidance lark. So you know, what are the competencies that I have and what other courses might I like to do to actually get those skills? But I think it's very important as well to recognise um, the role of guidance in mobility. I mean, guidance has been written into various council recommendations to support mobility. So where ESCO will fit in in this context, in working with an individual who's looking at, well, I have these skills and these competencies, but actually I'd like to eventually live and work in another part of Europe, guidance really is, is key to supporting that mobility agenda also. Um, but I would totally, um, you know, refer back as well to the, the links between the education and the labour market. And I think we have to be very careful as well that we don't expect all of the education providers to develop all of the skills and competencies for that particular job. There has to be an element of lifelong learning, there has to be an element of CPD, and there has to be an element of on-the-job support. And I think that's where employers have to, have to be encouraged to buy into this so that guidance can do its job. Because our role would be support the person to get the course, to get the skills, to get the qualifications, to get the job and then keep going, and then keep developing their skills. So at the entry level, and then what can they do next? So I think, you know, to, to use ESCO as the tool for guidance will actually help our job in so many different ways. And one final point from a, from a guidance perspective, um, one of the roles of guidance really is to work with all stakeholders, not just be the providers of helping somebody decide what am I going to do next. So when it is very obvious that there are several individuals 
who have particular skills and particular interests but there's no training programs and yet there's all these job vacancies. It's very much the role of guidance to engage with um, employers, education providers and I think it comes back to somebody mentioned there earlier on, how do you do this? It's very easy in Ireland, we're a small country, there's only four million of us. There's more in some of your cities. Um, so it's a lot easier for us to get people into the same room at the same time to discuss national issues to bring them back regionally. So I appreciate that's not easy everywhere else. Um, but it could be something to encourage because of the ESCO tool. It could be the excuse to get people into a room together. And if it's the task of guidance to get them together, I don't know. Um, but it could be, you know, use the tool to start the national dialogue um, and obviously I would see, see it as a vital part of, of guidance. Very good. Now, Jos, of course a lot of this guidance depends on employers being comfortable with the validation system and recognising it. That's not the case today all throughout the European Union. What can ESCO do to help in that validation process? <laughs> I think, uh, and I'm coming, I'm speaking about validation towards the standards of a qualification. I'm not speaking about uh, validation in an enterprise or uh, recognition in enterprise or in, in third sectors or whatever has happened, but I'm coming back to this issue too. I think what I said previously is that we have developed a qualification together with the labor market, with the people, the, uh, the standards. We have to work them out together. We have the same procedure to follow on one side to develop the process of the validation and the procedure of validation. And the same way to include the employers, the employees in the same procedure. And then you come out with an, let's say, a qualification that is supported by the labor market. If the labor market itself, itself is involved in the procedure and the process, like in the designing of the qualifications, I think you are on the right side. It's nothing more and nothing less, but it, you have to do this. And I think it's a, not sometimes an easy task. It's easier if you are, let's say, in a small country like mine, where you have not necessarily big industries, but more uh, small and medium enterprises, we have a tradition in discussing with our social partners, with the chambers, so I think it is easier for us. But I wouldn't say that it is impossible for others, but you have to go this way, then you can recognize really validation in the labor market. But I said I am coming back to the other ways, your recognition in enterprises or recognition in third sectors, in voluntary sectors. There, let's say the, the common language, ESCO, can be an, an issue for the individual. Nowadays it's difficult to the individual to come, he, is, he was recognized in the enterprise, but this recognition paper or whatever you have, proof you have, doesn't fit to, 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 to uh, it's not understandable on the standards of the qualification because the enterprise is very specific on his recognition. So if you use the same language, then you facilitate it for the validation process too. So you see, it's, it's not only on the, let's say, on the school and tr or education and training sector to do something. It's on the other way around too to do something on ESCO. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, I wanted to give the panel a final round of comments, but I realize that the time has run away from us. Big hand of applause for our panelists on this session. Thank you.